I'm Ben Micellis from the Midas Touch Network. Mark Meadows, the former chief of staff in the Trump administration, has lost his lawsuit that he brought in federal court against Nancy Pelosi and the January 6th committee to try to block the January 6th committee from taking his deposition and from obtaining his phone records and text messages through a January 6th committee issued subpoena. Judge Carl Nichols dismissed the lawsuit filed by Mark Meadows, and it was filed back in December of 2021. Let's break down the ruling and the procedural history here. You will recall back in September of 2021, the January 6th committee subpoenaed Mark Meadows for deposition testimony and for records. Around October, Donald Trump basically told Mark Meadows that he was invoking improperly, but claimed he was invoking executive privilege and demanded that Mark Meadows not turn over records to the January 6th committee. Meadows attorneys consulted with the Biden administration because executive privilege is not with former administrations. It is with current administration. See, you've been following the Midas Touch Network news updates and our legal analysis here to know all about that. And Biden informed him he was not invoking executive privilege. So Mark Meadows did turn over thousands of records, you know, text messages, not all of the records. He also produced a privilege log saying that there were certain records that he could not turn over, but he did turn over a certain amount of records, which we've talked about and we've seen in the January 6th committee has used. Then Meadows was set to testify in December before the January 6th committee and the day before he backed out and he filed this federal lawsuit in the Washington, D.C. federal courthouse. Judge Carl Nichols, a judge we've been talking about here a lot on the Midas Touch Network, who oversees a lot of other January 6th related cases because he's a federal judge in Washington, D.C. He was actually appointed by Donald Trump, but... He's been very level-handed and law and order in his application of the law and his rulings, especially related to January 6th. And Mark Meadows filed a lawsuit basically asserting, one, that the January 6th committee was not legitimately constituted because Kevin McCarthy didn't give assent. That is a ridiculous argument that has been rejected before. He also argued that he had to assert executive privilege and that there was no legitimate legislative activity that the January 6th committee was engaged in and again asserted that the executive privilege would no pun intended, Trump, any ability of the January 6th committee to subpoena and take his testimony. The January 6th committee filed a summary judgment over the summer, and in their motion, they basically asserted, no, we have a compelling interest. There is a legitimate government interest here trying to avoid future insurrections and based on our fact-finding obligations as the Congress uh, to determine uh, what what was the cause, how to avoid this, and to make findings and recommendations. Uh, so a summary judgment motion to dismiss Meadows' complaint was filed. At the same time, the January 6th committee also, because Meadows refused to testify, referred Meadows' failure to show up, uh, made a criminal referral to the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice did not pursue the criminal contempt uh, of Congress referral by the January 6th committee. But one of the reasons that they may not have was because this existing lawsuit by Mark Meadows that he filed was pending. Also, they've got Mark Meadows on a number of other potential criminal conduct as well. So that may be a reason why they were holding this over his head and saying, look, we're not going to criminally prosecute you here yet. We are going to wait until the outcome of the lawsuit that you filed, but we need your cooperation in connection with these other criminal investigations that we are pursuing of Trump. Nonetheless, the Department of Justice did not pursue the criminal contempt referral by the January 6th committee, but this lawsuit continued. And then the judge, Carl Nichols, did something very interesting over the summer as well. 
and asked for additional briefing on the parties regarding the issue of the speech and debate clause, which basically grants members of Congress, and the law has also been construed to impact committees through a case called Eastman as well. It gives them immunity from lawsuits. Now, here's the interesting thing. Neither Meadows nor the January 6th committee actually asserted speech or debate clause immunity as an issue in their briefing. Meadows, of course, didn't bring it up because he didn't want the case dismissed about it. But why didn't the January 6th committee assert speech or debate clause immunity? It's an interesting, it's an interesting question, but I think the reason that they did that is they wanted to prevail on the merits to basically say, we want a judicial finding that executive privilege does not apply here at all, and we don't need to assert the speech or debate clause privilege as an issue here to dismiss this case. We want a finding on the merits. But one of the things Judge Carl Nichols said is, doesn't this issue concern my jurisdiction, the court's jurisdiction? Because if there's a speech or debate clause which issue which functions as an immunity, isn't that the case then that the January 6th committee shouldn't even be sued at all by Mark Meadows for any type of relief, including injunctive relief? And doesn't the case law also state that it, it relates to injunctive relief just like in situations like this? And so he heard the oral arguments, so he heard written arguments rather from the parties, and still the parties were like, we don't really want to assert speech or debate privilege issues. We want to go to the merits. And Judge Carl Nichols, in the ruling that he just issued um, and dismissed Mark Meadows' lawsuit, actually said, I'm not going to go to the merits. Mark Meadows' case should never have been filed. It's a very interesting ruling. And what was said in this ruling by Judge Carl Nichols is he said speech or debate clause immunity or the speech or debate privilege functions essentially as an immunity from civil lawsuits where Congress members or committees are engaged in legitimate legislative conduct and activity. And then Nichols says on page 19 of his order, without a doubt, the select committee's investigation of the January 6th attack is legitimately tied to Congress's legislative functions. And then what the court said is the speech or debate clause is not like invoking the Fifth Amendment. It's not like invoking attorney-client privilege. What the judge says, it functions more as a jurisdictional issue, kind of like a doctrine called sovereign immunity, where a party can't be sued at all if sovereign immunity exists in certain situations. And so what the judge said here is, what I should be doing, sua sponte, S-U-A space S-P-O-N-T-E, sua sponte, meaning on my own, what I should be doing on my own is to determine if I even have jurisdiction here, regardless of if the parties are bringing this issue to my attention. And the judge said, I have an obligation, sua sponte, if I see that the speech and debate clause immunity or privilege, however you want to construe it, applies I need to say, then I can't even hear this case. This is just the legislative beef between the legislative branch and Meadows, and I can't infringe on the, le as the judiciary, I can't infringe on the legislative powers. The le This is a legislative branch thing. The courts shouldn't be asked to get involved in the disputes. It's such an interesting finding and way of thinking, and I've seen a lot of law review articles on this recently, and a lot of questions that I've been getting asked is like, why is the federal judiciary almost being given a supremacy over the legislative branch when Trump and all these peoples run to the courts to try to stop Congress from doing things that should be legitimate legislative conduct that Congress does. It's just, it's Congress's right to have these records. And it's so interesting because that is actually what uh, Judge Carl Nichols found here and basically said, look, based on the speech or debate clause, which provides an immunity to congressional committees of civil lawsuits, including injunctive relief, 
Injunctive relief here meaning Mark Meadows asking a court to stop and join, stop the committee from getting records, phone records, text messages, and from getting his deposition. And Judge Carl Nichols says the speech and debate clause immunity applies to that. And I don't have the right to make a ruling that they that they shouldn't be able to have that. I can't rule for you, Mark Meadows. So I have no option other than to look at the immunity and dismiss the case. So Mark Meadows' case was dismissed on the basis of the application of the speech and debate clause immunity, not even going to all those other issues. You almost wonder, though, why the January 6th committee, again, didn't assert it. I know the January 6th committee maybe wanted a ruling on the merits there. I mean, perhaps what the January 6th committee was worried about is, well, if you recognize the immunity of January 6th committee under speech and debate here, could other members of Congress, individual members who were involved in the insurrection, could they potentially utilize that and invoke it to try to avoid testifying the same way, and you see how this is all connected, the same way Lindsey Graham invoked the speech and debate clause privilege to say that he was involved in legitimate legislative activity going on a fact-finding mission when he threatened Brad Raffensperger to basically overturn the results of the election in Georgia and engage in other pernicious conduct in Georgia. But I, I see that that could be a concern, but look what happened in the Lindsey Graham case. In Lindsey Graham, he asserted speech or debate, but then you go to the Supreme Court case we've been talking about here on the Midas Touch Network from 1972 or the mid-1970s called United States versus Gravel, and that involves uh, former Senator Gravel, where the idea of what is legitimate legislative activity or conduct is delineated and what is not legitimate legislative legislative activity is exhorting, cajoling, doing things like working with the Trump campaign, engaging in PR and public relations. And so uh, that type of, you know, pernicious and, and threatening and criminal conduct would fall outside the scope of the speech or debate clause immunity anyway. So I don't think that the January 6th committee really should have worried that a favorable ruling for them finding that the speech or debate clause immunity applies to dismiss Mark Meadows' case could be used by insurrectionist members of Congress as a sword and a shield to kind of prevent their testimony in cases where that is wanted. So I, I don't I don't know is the short answer. I think the January 6th committee probably should have used it because here's the thing, why it all matters. Mark Meadows' case dismissed. Not only dismissed, Mark Meadows' is now going to be requested again by the January 6th committee to testify. He's going to it's going to be demanded that he turn over these records. They're going to his phone companies to get these records. So ultimately if the goal is to get his deposition, to get his testimony and to get the records because he may try to avoid the deposition again, he may try to avoid but you get his records from the phone company, that's a win. There's no other way to construe this ruling as a win, a big win for the January 6th committee. It's just so interesting that legal observers may have thought that what this ruling would have been about was whether or not Meadows' executive privilege claim applied or whether or not there was um, legitimate legislative activity. That was one of Mark Meadows' claims claiming it wasn't. And I guess if you could say why the January 6th committee also didn't want to invoke the speech or debate, maybe they realized that Meadows' arguments were so frivolous that they wanted to win on the executive privilege and speech and, debla speech and debate issues, get a judicial finding by Judge Carl Nichols, who was a Trump-appointed judge, and then use that as precedent in all these other cases to say that executive privilege doesn't apply here. That could have been strategically what they were thinking. But Judge Carl Nichols was like, no, I'm not even going there. You win January 6th committee, but you win because I don't have jurisdiction. You win because, frankly, the legislative branch is a co-equal branch of government, and me as a judge, I shouldn't be weighing into this. You have the right to get the records. He should turn the records over. 
I shouldn't have any obligation to even be a referee in this dispute. It shouldn't come before me at all. And if he doesn't respond to you, then pursue your other methods of enforcing your subpoena. But that doesn't involve the judiciary. So a like I think it's a fairly brilliant ruling, and I think it actually reinforces the strength of the legislative branch. And a lot of people have been saying, again, the legislative branch has this strength and power. Why are judges and courts getting, you know, being interfered with? What I wonder as well, though, because you follow all of these videos, right? We know that Kelly Ward, the MAGA extremist and chair of the Republican Party in Arizona, who has that litigation where she filed an injunction motion uh, or an injunction lawsuit against the January 6th committee where she lost in the district court and then she appealed to the Ninth Circuit. She lost in the Ninth Circuit and now that's before the Supreme Court an emergency application and the January 6th committee has been ordered to respond. I wonder there though, speech or debate clause was not invoked there either, but it would seem to hold jurisdictionally that it should apply there as well, that she can't just file an injunction against them. They're immune from that lawsuit in court. Now, something about precedent, a DC district court ruling, federal courts do not create precedent that another federal court has to follow. It is persuasive authority that a district court ruled a certain way. And if I was before, let's say, a central district California court, I could point to a D.C. district court ruling and say, look what this judge did. But there's, it's only persuasive. It doesn't have to be followed. And a lot of time, too, all the district courts have to follow, let me say this, is the circuit court that oversees that specific district. So in D.C., they have to follow the D.C. Uh, circuit Court of Appeals. California, it's the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, right? In Florida, it's the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals. There's a number of states there, um, and the district courts in those states have to follow what the circuit court says. And ultimately, everybody has to follow the precedent from the Supreme Court. But there are actually times where you have circuit court splits. This circuit says this, this circuit says that. That's usually a case where different circuits are conflicting in their rulings where the Supreme Court grants what's called certiorari to resolve a split in these circuits and then say this is how we resolve it and there should be kind of a, a comedy, C-O-M-I-T-Y, between the circuits. And that's kind of a case that a Supreme Court would generally take on full oral argument. So a lot of concepts here, but the bottom line, Mark Meadows loses. January 6th committee should get the phone records. Mark Meadows is, of course, going to appeal. He's going to try to stop it. Uh, but a, a very harsh ruling by, uh, by a judge who was appointed by Trump and a favorable ruling for the January 6th committee, although the course it took to get that favorable ruling was unexpected. I'm Ben Micellis from the Midas Touch Network. Hey, hit the subscribe button now. We're on our way to 1 million subscribers. Thanks to you. Also, please join one of our memberships at patreon.com slash Midas Touch. We are not funded by any millionaires or billionaires. We have no outside investors at all. We are purely fueled by democracy, empowered by your generosity. So if you can help, please try. No worries. I Either way, there's exclusive content, behind the scenes footage, extra podcasts, and more. That's patreon.com slash Midas Touch, P A T R E O N.com slash Midas Touch. Check it out. Until next time, I'm Ben Micellis. Midas Touch is unapologetically pro democracy. And look, we know you are too. So please make sure you check out our best selling shirt and our best selling gear, the unapologetically pro democracy gear. And hey, while you're at it, make sure you check out my favorite shirt and one of our most famous designs. It wasn't rigged, you're just a loser. At store.midastouch.com. That's store.midastouch.com.